Hey Foxes, I hope you're all okay. Um, we are going to read chapter six pack today, which is a Peter chapter. And last we heard of Peter, he was sleeping in the baseball dugout. And then Pax met Bristle and her brother Runt. So I wonder if they find each other this time. Peter recognised the sound before he was fully awake. The footfalls of a herd of just released kids, their hoots, the thumping of the eager fists into gloves. He scrambled out from under the bench and grabbed his stuff. Too late. Twenty boys and their coach were streaming down the hill. Up at the parking lot, a bunch of adults were overseeing the dismissal and some of them wore uniforms. His best option was to join the dozens or so of kids who were already scattered over the bleachers, heads bent together in clusters of two and three, and to blend in when they left. Oh, we've got a picture. There he is. Peter climbed to, climbed to the bleachers climbed the bleachers to the top row and dropped his pack. So the bleachers, the chairs, the benches. A kid watching a baseball practice, nothing could be more normal, yet his heart skidded. Below, the coach started lobbing fungos into the field. The players were mostly the usual guys you expect to see on a ball field, all muscle and shout. Peter found the one he wanted to watch, a small kid with, straw -coloured, with a straw-coloured crew cut and a bleached out red t-shirt playing shortstop. While the rest of the players scrambled around like puppies, this kid was a statue. Hands poised, waist high, eyes glued to the coach's back. The instant wood smacked cowhide, he sprang. Somehow he managed to reach every ball that came anywhere near his territory. Even though he was so short, he looked like someone's tag-along kid brother. Peter knew he himself wasn't the kind of kid you'd expect to find on a ball field either, and he was even less at home on the dugout with all the shoulder punching and trash talking, but a baseball field was the only place where he felt he was exactly where he was born to be. The feeling that brought Peter that brought Peter was something he had never even tried to describe to anyone else, partly because it felt too private, but mostly because he didn't think he had the words to explain it. Holy came the closest, and calm was in the mix, but neither was exactly right. For a crazy minute, Peter sensed that the shortstop, uh, that the shortstop understood that about the holy and calm was, and was feeling it too, right now. The coach had taken the mound and was tossing puffballs. The batters were hitting sharp liners and grounders, and the outfielders were finally paying attention, or at least facing in the right direction. The shortstop was still the one to watch. He looked like he was stitched together with live wires, gaze steady to the play. Peter recognised that kind of concentration. Sometimes his eyes would actually go dry because he forgot to blink. So focused he was, was, he, was he on every move of every player and knew it paid off. Like the kid in the red t-shirt below him, Peter owned his territory on a ball field. He loved that territory right down to the cut grass, dry dust smell of it. But what he loved more was the fence behind it. The fence that told him exactly what his responsibility was and what wasn't. A ball fell inside that fence, he'd better field it. A ball soared over it and it wasn't his to worry about anymore. Nice and clear. Peter often wished that responsibility had such bright tall fences around it off of the ball field too. When Peter's mother had died, he'd gone for a while to a therapist. At seven years old, he hadn't wanted to talk, or maybe he just hadn't known how to shrink that kind of loss into words. The therapist, a kind-eyed woman with long, a long silver braid, said that was okay, that that was perfectly okay. And for the whole session, Peter would pull little cars and trucks from a toy box. There must have been a hundred of them in there. Peter figured later that the woman had cleaned out a toy store for him and crashed them together two by two. When he finished, he would always say the same thing. That must have been hard for you. Your mum gets in a car to go buy groceries a regular day and she never comes home. Peter never answered, but he remembered a sense of rightness about those words and about the whole hour, as if he finally were where he should be and that there was nothing else he should be doing except crashing those little cars and hearing that it must have been hard for him. Until one day the therapist said something else. Peter, do you feel angry? No, he said quickly, never. A lie. And then he'd gotten off the floor and taken a single green apple Jolly Rancher from the brass bowl by the door, exactly the way he did at the end of every session. 
That was the deal the kind-eyed therapist had made with him. Whenever he'd had enough, he could take a sweet and the session would be over and left. But outside, he'd kicked the sweet into the gutter and on the way home, he told his father he wasn't going back again. His father hadn't argued. In fact, it had seemed to be a relief to him, but not to Peter. Had the nice therapist known all along he'd been angry that last day and that he'd done something terrible, that as punishment, his mother hadn't taken him to the store. And did she blame him for what happened? A few months later, Peter had gotten packed. He'd come across a fox on over on the side of the road near his house. So soon after watching his mother's coffin lowered into the ground, he'd felt an unmistakable need to bury the body. As he looked around for a good place, he found the den filled with three cold, stiffed kit bodies and one little ball of grey fur still warm and breathing. He tucked Pax into his sweatshirt pocket and brought him home and said, not asked, said, I'm keeping him. His dad had said, OK, OK, for a while. The kit mewed piteously all through the night and hearing him, Peter had thought that if he could visit the kind-eyed therapist again, he'd smash those toy cars together all day and all night, all day and all night, forever. Not because he was angry, just to make everybody else see. Thinking about Pax made the old anxiety snake tighten around Peter's chest. He needed to get moving again, make up some time. The practice was breaking up now, boys lopping in from the field, shedding equipment as they streamed past the dugout. As soon as the field was clear, he dropped from the bleachers, pulled his rucksack down and hitched it over his shoulders. Just as he set out along the diamond, though, he saw the shortstop. Peter hesitated. He should take off, try to blend in with the stragglers leaving the school grounds. But the rest of the team had left this kid to bag up the equipment and walk back alone. And Peter knew how that felt. He picked up a couple of balls and handed them over. Hey! The boy took the balls with a cautious smile. Hey! Nice play! The last liner! That ball had hair! The boy looked away at the scuffed dirt, but Peter could see he was pleased. Yeah, well, the first baseman made it look cleaner than it was. Now nah, you planted that ball. You, your first baseman would be lucky to catch a cold by himself. No offence. The boy gave Peter a real grin. Yeah, coach's nephew, you play? Peter nodded. Centre field. You knew here? Oh, I don't live here. I... Peter nodded his head vaguely south. Hampton? Yeah, Hampton, right? The boy's face closed. Scouting before Saturday's game, jerk. He spat and walked back to the dugout. As he left the school grounds, Peter congratulated himself on his quick thinking, covering his runaway tracks. But somehow he felt kind of bad anyway. Somehow he felt lousy, actually. He shrugged the feeling off. What was it his dad said about feelings? Something about a quarter and a cup of coffee and checked his watch. 4.15. He'd lost over three hours. Peter pressed faster, faster, but when he came to the town square again, he crossed to the opposite side of, from the hardware shop and forced himself to walk at an even pace past the library, past the bus station, past a cafe. Then he counted off a thousand steps before he risked lifting his head. When he did, he checked his watch again. 4.50. His grandfather was probably packing up his stuff now. Peter imagined him walking to his rusty blue Chevy, fitting in the key in the ignition. And with that, imagine, his anxiety struck. Knocking the breath right out of him, he scaled a low wooden fence and dropped into scrubby brush. He pushed in a good safe 30 feet until the saplings rose up taller than he was, until his anxiety let him breathe again, before turning parallel to the road. It was rougher going now, but 15 min minutes later he reached it, the highway. Peter shadowed the entrance ramp, crouching low, then, at a break in traffic, ran down the culvert, scaled the chain-link fence and dropped to the other side, his heart beating hard. He'd made it. He locked into the trees, keeping an eye out for a likely place to cut west. And in just a few minutes, he found one. A dirt road was running perpendicular to the highway. Well, not much more than an old wagon path, to be honest, but it was heading in the right direction and would be easy to walk even at night time. He turned in. For a short while, the trees beside him grew denser as he walked. And only bird calls and squirrel rustling broke the silence. Peter realised he might have seen the last of civilization for a while. The thought lifted him. But a few minutes later, the road turned and a corner began to run along an old pasture dotted with gnarled fruit trees in a ragged bloom. A stone-walled border, the field and a low barn stood at the far corner. There were no lights on in the barn, no car or truck beside it. Still, Peter's heart crashed. The barn looked freshly painted and some of the roof shingles were raw pink of new wood. This was the road to someone's home. Worse, it might lead to a bigger road that Atlas had been too old to show.
in any case, wasn't a shortcut across the hills. Peter dropped his pack and sank into the narrow joy jog in the stone wall, exhausted and starving. He tugged his boots off and peeled down his socks. Two bad blisters throbbed on each heel and they were going to kill when they broke. Peter dug out his extra pair of socks from the bottom of his rucksack and worked them over the first pair. He rested his head back against the rough stone, still giving off, off a little warmth from the day's sun, which was now hovering just over the lines of the trees, bathing the field in a peach-coloured glow. He pulled the raisins out and ate them one at a time, taking small sips of water in between. Then he opened two packets of string cheese and took four crackers from the sleeve. He ate as slowly as he could, watching the sun over the orchard, surprised to find he could actually mark its, sink its sinking movement. How had he lived 12 years and never known about this sunsets? Peter laced his boots. Just as he started to rise, he caught sight of a deer which bounded into the orchard from the woods beyond. He held his breath as the orchard filled 14 deer in all. They began to graze with a few nibbled delicately at the low branches of the trees. Peter squatted back down and the closest one, a doe with a spindly spotted fawn beside her, turned her head to look directly at him. Peter raised his palm slowly, hoping to let her know he meant no harm. The doe moved between Peter and her fawn, but after a while she dipped her head into the grass again. And then the clear twilight air was split by the screech of a saw, of a saw biting through the wood from the barn. The herd startled in unison and peeled away into the darkening woods, their white tails flashing. Before she bounded off, the doe sent another look straight at Peter, one that seemed to say, you humans, you ruin everything. Peter took off. Back at the highway, half the cars had their headlights on now, and it seemed they were all trained directly on him. He ducked off the road. The ground there was spongy and smelled of peat. He was just debating about risking the flashlight when his foot sank with a splash. He grabbed an overhanging branch and pulled himself out, but it was too late. He could feel cold swamp water seeping into his boots. Peter cursed. Not bringing more socks? Another mistake. It had to be better. It had better be the last of the trip. And then, clambering back heart to higher ground, he made another, much worse mistake. His right foot caught on a root and he fell. He heard the bone break, a soft, muffled snap. At the same time, he felt a sharp stab. He sat panting with the stunning pain for a moment. Finally, he pulled his foot free from the un unlaced boot, wincing at each motion. He eased down the wet socks and what he saw made him gasp. His foot was swelling so fast he could actually see it. Peter rolled his socks up, nearly crying at the pain it caused, then gritted his teeth to work his foot back into the boot, work his foot back into the boot before it could swell any more. He crawled to a tree and pulled himself upright. He tested his weight on his foot and nearly collapsed again. The pain was far worse than anything he'd felt before. It made the broken thumb feel like a mosquito bite in comparison. He couldn't walk. Okay, and that's the end of chapter six. Next up, we have got a PAX chapter. So, I hope you'll all join me to listen to the next chapter on Monday. Have a lovely weekend, stay safe, and I'll see you soon. Bye.